Well, good evening and welcome as you're coming to join us now. We're going to spend a few minutes just letting people into the Zoom room. Um, but for those of you who are the early birds, welcome. Really glad to have you with us. And what we'd love to ask you to do as you join us and as we wait for a few more to come along, it would be great to hear from you as we can't see your lovely faces tonight, but we know that you're there. So as you come and join us now, please do put your name in the chat. We'd love to know who you are, where you're from, what part of the, this beautiful country or indeed across the aisles um, you're from this evening. So that would be great. My name's Rachel. We'll do a fuller introduction in just a moment. But um, myself and David, who you can see here on your screen and hosting you through this evening's Time to Talk webinar. So just as you're coming in, David, evening to you. How are you doing? Yes, yes, doing well. Um, as you know, Rachel, Monday nights, um, and many of the parents in the call may well have young children. So uh, I'm still trying to catch up with myself as we start the week, to be honest. But absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah doing well. Brilliant. So, David, you're all the way over in Northern Ireland. I'm here in Ely in Cambridgeshire. Do put in the chat, like I said, as you come and join where you are dialing in from this evening. But yeah, David, as you said, we're expecting many um, parents to come and join us this evening, maybe some youth workers, some church leaders, some teachers. I, like you, David, can fully empathise with the juggle that is any weekday evening, in fact, not just a Monday. So um, how's your evening been this evening then, David? As we're waiting for folks to come and join us, tell us what it looks like for you as a parent on a Monday night. Well, do you know what? The house is eerily quiet right now because um my wife and uh two of the kids have gone with the dog to go and collect my third my, my boy who's up at beavers there's been a singing lesson there's been dinner making um yeah it's all all going on but uh yeah a lot of fun catching up from school um yeah we have one in p1 one in p4 and one in p6 so yeah a lot of a lot of chaos holy chaos as i like to call it Absolutely. So we can tell you're with you mentioning the school system there. You're over in Northern Ireland, slightly different to some of us here in England. But yeah, I can share the uh, the joys and trials and tribulations of the juggle. Um, for me this evening, I've had a day at work, taught French to a few children this afternoon, as you do on a Monday, football, tennis lessons. And now here we are. So anyway, great to be here with um, fellow hosts and panellists um, this evening. Let's kick off, shall we, and make an official start into our evening. Um, as you come and join us, thank you so much for joining us this evening for what is called our Time to Talk webinar. We are genuinely grateful to have your time this evening, especially at the start of no doubt another busy week for you. Um, and we really hope that this evening's next hour and a bit that we're together will um, equip you, encourage you, enthuse you, challenge you. Um, and so let me tell you a little bit about who we are and what we're going to be um, about this evening. Um, as we said, whatever backdrop you come from, whether you're um, a teacher, whether you're a church leader, a parent, a youth leader, we, on behalf of many of us across the UK, we're just so grateful for the ways in which you invest in young people, whether that's your own children or many that you're involved with in youth ministry or in churches. But where this comes from this evening is that um, we at the Evangelical Alliance, and let me introduce myself first. My name is Rachel Heffer. I serve at the EA as Head of Mission and co-hosting the tonight, as you heard a moment ago, with David. Would you like to tell us, David, what your role is at the EA? Yes, I'm uh, head of the Evangelical Alliance in Northern Ireland, and um, I wrote a good chunk of the resource that we're going to be uh, talking about tonight. Um, just one thing, I'm seeing some people just saying that the chat is disabled, but if you have any questions or comments, um, I want to share where you're coming from. If you put that in the Q&A box, we'll be able to pick that up there. Amazing. Thanks, David. Um, so do do that as we go on through. But as we were saying, so right back at the start of um, 2023, we at the Evangelical Alliance were thrilled to produce a new resource that David's just mentioned. It looks like this. It's called Time to Talk. And what we're doing tonight is pulling out some of the content of that in order to 
speak to parents about, um, and not just parents, as we said, people from all different sectors that work with young people, who engage with schools, who work or engage with churches as well, to really get to grips with some of the big questions of RSE, relationships and sex education, and how we grapple with some of those big conversations with our children and young people. So we launched it back earlier in the year in February, and our feeling was is that actually together, as Evangelical Alliance, along with friends, we're delighted this evening to have with us um, Ed Drew and Amy from Faith in Kids and wonderful Rose, who's come to join us as well, um, from diff bringing different stories, different experiences, different expertise, um, from working in ministry alongside uh, church leaders and youth leaders and parents, and indeed speaking from a perspective of being a parent ourselves. Our hope is, is that as we journey through this evening, you'll be equipped and encouraged to hear of their experiences. So this evening, our theme, whilst this resource is full of loads of different content, the theme that we've picked out particularly this evening is this, talking about our bodies. Um, I'm a parent of two boys. I have a 12 and a 14 year old. And I know, as I'm sure many of you do, that sometimes just getting to grips with some of these real life gritty conversations is not always the most enviable position to be in. We sometimes don't know the words. We don't know the right time. We don't know what's age appropriate and so on. Um, and yet we do know that because of what's being taught on our school curriculums, because of the conversations and the landscape that our young people live in, we probably know deep down that it's really critical and crucial. So I hope this evening from different people, the input and share of experiences, I hope is that you will um, just be inspired and challenged and maybe grow in confidence from what others share so that we can go from here this evening um, just feeling equipped or better equipped to engage with our own children and young people against the challenging landscape that we find ourselves in. So how we're gonna do that is this, I'm gonna to hand to David in just a moment, but during the course of this next hour or so, we're gonna just look at the landscape that we find ourselves in. We're gonna hear from um, Ed Drew in just a few moments as well as to some of his shared experience and learning and top tips to help us grapple within these contexts. We're gonna then, as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna hear from parents to look at some of these challenging um, aspects and conversations. And then with Nicola, um, my colleague here from the EA as well, we're gonna look at actually what does some of the policy around RSE and relationships and sex education actually tell us and inform us. So how can we actually grapple with and engage with some of the schools and what they're teaching our children, young people as well. So hopefully that sounds of interest to you, equipping, inspiring, and maybe it's educational along the way as well. But um, let me just hand straight to David now as he tells us a little bit more about where this resource came from, what's in it, what the context is, and we'll dive straight in. So David, over to you. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Rachel. Um, yeah, my pleasure to be here this evening and speak to the resource. I keep holding up, um, I'm Rachel as well, a hard copy, and we'll show you how to get some on those at the end but it's also free to download on our website. And why this, why now? Well, you probably like me, you've seen headlines that um, have maybe scared you as a parent. You've seen some things that are allegedly being taught in schools that are really concerning to you. That might be about gender, it might be about sexual practices, it might be about all kinds of things. And you're wondering what, what do I do as a, as a Christian parent? I want to talk to my kids about this, but I'm not quite sure where to start, how to start the conversation. Maybe um, sexual failure means that people aren't, um, are reluctant to have the conversation. And we just came across lots of examples where people weren't sure where to start. Um, it's really timely. It's being looked at right across the UK in terms of public policy. And Nicola is going to talk about that later. But it's really timely about, on a political angle. But it's always um, a timely conversation. And these things here, are mobile phones, have just changed the landscape completely for everyone all at once. So what we do in this resource is we try to help parents and carers have better conversations with their children and with their child's school. So that's um, an important part of what, we, what we're trying to do. And the resource looks at the big picture. Culture often wants to jump straight into the hot button issues, but we try and take a step back and look at the big Bible story and the big cultural story. Tonight, as we say, we're focusing on sort of our bodies. And so um, you can see in the resource, if you don't know, or you get a physical copy, we look at um, how do we talk to kids about their bodies? How do we affirm what is good uh, about that? Um, and how do we um, help them to grow in their understanding appropriately as they grow 
older. And so we look at that with young kids, as you know, are really curious about their bodies, about their siblings' bodies, about all of that. We look at gender stereotyping as they grow up. We want them to understand that sex and our bodies are really good gifts from a good God. And then we look at puberty and those changes that um that begin to happen to us all and those awkward conversations. And we want to affirm parents and say, this is difficult. It's not about one big conversation, but you can do it. You're really well placed and equipped. And then another part of the resource that's relevant to tonight, we do jump into some case studies on issues like pornography or abortion. But we also look at um, really um, timely things like sexual harassment. I'm sure you've seen the stories, obviously, about Russell Brand and, and all that's going on there. Uh, and we want to help young people understand their bodies and the law and um, how, we are all, how we ought to treat each other. I, as a dad, as I was putting this together, some of these stats really jumped out and, to be honest, um, scared me. You'll see it on the screen there. But um, this... This is an Ofsted report from 2021 that basically shows that sexual harassment, including online and sexual abuse, has become normalized for many children and young people. And you'll see there that um, whenever you look at girls um, who are at 15 years old, 79% are saying sexual assault of any kind. These things happen a lot or sometimes between people my age are unwanted or inappropriate sexual comments. And then we jump down and 88% of girls say that um, they often, um, these things happen a lot, or sometimes being sent sexual pictures or videos that they did not want to see, or being put under pressure themselves to provide sexual images. Jumping on to consent, um, and again, we the conversation in our culture seems to be that as long as people have consented and it's legal, then everything else is fine. There's no real conversation going on until something big happens um, and, and hits the headlines. And then we begin to question the culture ar around us. And so we look at that and we try and look at what's culture's narrative when it comes to sexuality and identity and consent. And actually, what does the Bible say? And consent is, is basically a bare minimum starting point rather than the end of the conversation. So those are just a few highlights from the resource. There's loads more in there. There's lots of sort of handy hints and tips. But those are just a few bits that I wanted to um to share with you. It's now my pleasure to hand over to Ed. Um, Ed is the Minister Directory Ministry Director for Faith in Kids, and we're delighted to have Ed and Amy with us this evening. Um, Ed used to be an engineer, but uh, left that to set up uh, Faith in Kids, and because of a, a growing demand that he saw from parents and for um, from churches. He's he's written quite a number of books, Meals with Jesus, The Wonder of Easter, and The Adventure of, of Christmas. But we're really delighted that Ed has brought his considerable intellect and talent and communication skills to these kinds of areas because we just need that right now. Um, Ed, it's my pleasure to hand over to you. You can continue introducing yourself or dive straight in, but thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thanks, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Faith in Kids has a podcast for parents, and uh, one of the guests we interviewed uh, was a lady who's a retired GP. She's a mother and a grandmother. So in my mind, that makes her the perfect person to talk about these issues that we're discussing tonight. Bodies, puberty, sex, all of it. And there's a moment in the podcast where she said to me, Ed, you do know, don't you, that you are the best person in the world to talk to your daughter about her body. and I actually laughed out loud. You can hear it on the podcast. And she saw that I essentially couldn't believe that was the case. So she went on to say, Ed, there's probably a couple of diagrams I could show you. There's a couple of words that you should have learned in school, but you probably have forgotten. But after that, you can do it better than me because you know your daughter better than I do. You know when to have the conversation. You know when to stop the conversation. You know when she'd love to talk more and when she'd love to stop, and you know when to pick it up, whether it's a day, a month, or a year later. I couldn't argue with that. To be a parent, to be a carer, is to be the world expert on your children. So although we may wince and wish it wasn't us, we are the best people in the world to talk to our children about their bodies and these issues. Now, there's one verse I would, uh, I'd love to share. 
And it's just the headline of this conversation. And it's Psalm 139, verse 14. And it says this, I praise you, God, because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. To be a Christian is to know the creator of our bodies, the one who handmade and chose every detail of each of our bodies. When my family go for a walk, my sons in particular love to ask me, can we drink from this stream? Can we drink from this river? Could we drink from this lake? And they've seen gadgets and adverts of all sorts of things that claim they can purify water. So we've been through the drill, the faster flowing and the higher up a, a mountain the water comes from, the purer it is. And I've told them of a source where the water comes out the ground at the top of the mountain and it's as pure as can be and you can drink from there. The closer to the source, the safer it is to drink. And you don't touch the stagnant water. If you look through this Time to Talk booklet that David's written, if you look at these statistics, he's just said he finds them frightening. It can be like drinking from a stagnant source to consider the world our children are growing up in. To be a Christian is to be drinking from the source. To be a Christian is to know the one who invented bodies and puberty, sex and strong feelings. So do you see those two headlines? To be a parent is the best one in the world to talk about it. To be a Christian means we're offering our children truth, purity, flourishing. Everything else I'm going to say is just tips. I might be right. I might be wrong. But those two things are going to remain the same. Because God has made it that way. So just a few tips then. So the first one, how do we make these conversations less awkward? Firstly, we start early, we talk regularly, and it's not a one-off. Do not wait for the day your children say, please, can we sit down? Can you get out every diagram? Can you say all those words and can we just deal with it? The birds and the bit, that's not going to happen. Instead, from the first days in a bath when they're looking at their body and playing with all the different parts and spotting the difference with a sister and whatever it is, we're talking about bodies. We don't just leave it for one-offs. We don't leave it for their birthday or Christmas or whatever we might pretend. And we don't wait until they talk to us or there's a crisis in the school playground. We are the ones who are talking about it first. I make it my goal for my children to tell me, please, Dad, can you stop now? I want my conversation to be less awkward than they find it. So I just keep on going and I keep on asking them questions. Secondly, talk about everything and say the words. We've got a podcast I'll show you later with an Australian expert on this, and she's shouting these words, trying to get us to say them out loud. We don't say willy. We don't say front bottom. We say penis. We say vagina. We say breasts. We say the word from the beginning. And we're not coy about them because that way the ch our children get to know there are words for these things and we can discuss them openly. Thirdly. The Bible offers beautiful freedom to boys and girls. Uh, there is talk about gender, more than we're used to in some ways. The Bible is clear. God made every cell of our body to be male or female. He made us boys and girls. But I wonder perhaps if Christians, we are prone to have more gender stereotypes in the world we're in, and that's not from the Bible. The Bible does say things about gender. But as far as boys and girls are concerned, there is huge freedom. So in the Bible, David wrote more poetry than anyone else. And we have the story of Deborah, who took God's people into battle. We have women who are role models for their strength and their bravery. And we have men who are role models for their ability to sing and dance. The Bible gives tremendous freedom to boys and girls. So a boy can choose to do things that he wants and a girl can do the things she wants within godly reasonableness, freedom. And lastly, you do want them to hear it from you. In that moment when you're feeling super awkward, when you wish this conversation wasn't happening to you, please just check. Would you rather they heard this in the playground? Would they rather they heard something about pregnancy happens when you hold hands? Wouldn't you rather they heard it all from you? Wouldn't you rather you did it a year too early than four years too late? 
wouldn't you rather they were the ones they could come to to ask their questions because they knew you were fine with it? I know that's the case. Keep telling ourselves that when we find it difficult. And then a roadmap roughly for navigating the ages. This is all children are different. They develop at different times and ages, intellect, physical, puberty. These all happen at different ages, but just very roughly. Perhaps preschool is just a time to talk about bodies. It's the conversations that happen in the bath. It's just getting used to it. And preschool is the ones who run around in the summer without any clothes on jumping into paddling pools. So bodies are the things we talk about with our preschoolers. We just get used to those conversations. Fives to sevens, we could talk about care for our bodies and privacy. That is, we look after our bodies and we cover up the bits that are underneath our swimming costumes. We keep them to ourselves. We don't show them to others and we don't let others touch them. And we're careful what pictures we see. We might talk about good and bad pictures. They help them to understand how to navigate it because pornography and images like that seem to be everywhere and you can stumble across them. Eights to elevens, I think this is the stage of life to talk about images, sex and puberty. This booklet, A Time to Talk, I think it says two thirds of people have seen pornography by the age of 11. So wouldn't it be great if we'd prepared our children for that because mostly it's by accident. You just turn it off, you walk away and you talk to someone who loves you. Talking about sex and puberty because isn't it, wouldn't it be great to talk about puberty before it happens? We've picked up that it can be frightening and difficult. So to know it's going to come, to know what's going to happen when it does. 11s to 14s. This is a time to talk about emotions because emotions often feel like they're out of control. It's a time to talk about body image, to discover that this changing body is still a gift from God. And he says it's beautiful, even if it's not the one we would have chosen. And to talk about consent, your body is yours. You keep it to yourself. You talk to those who love you most about it. And continuing the conversation about sex. And then 15s to 18s. This is a stage just to make sure the conversation stays open. Keep listening. Keep listening to their questions. Know that in just a few years time, they won't need to come to you. And you might not know what they're doing. They might not live anywhere near you. So this is a stage for the conversation to stay open so they know they can always talk to you. And perhaps you can offer wisdom rather than rules, helping them to make good decisions rather than just knowing what is right and wrong. Uh, Faith in Kids, we're trying to offer resources in this area. Uh, Who Am I is a set of free to download Sunday school resources for under 11s where we're just trying to start that conversation, because if children know they can say these words and talk about these things in church, then they'll be certain they can talk about them. And then a book that came from that series, looking at identity, parenting through the lens of identity, which is truly Christian, raising confident kids, a book you can get. You can search that where you normally find your books. And then that podcast I mentioned, we do one for the whole family. We call it Faith in Kids for Kids. And we've got that series of Who Am I as an all family podcast, 20 minutes. We reckon it works for five to 13 year olds. Listen to it in your car, because if you're driving at 60 miles an hour on a motorway, no one can leave as the Bible is opened and you ask to pray. And then that's the podcast I mentioned. If you were to Google Faith in Kids, Patricia, this podcast will come up. She's an Australian expert. She's brilliant at writing about these things and it's a real help. Her books are also great. Uh, I hope this has been helpful. I look forward to your questions. Amazing. Thanks so much, Ed. That's really, um, really helpful in giving us such a broad um, framework, I think, of delving into some of that, especially at the developmental stages of um, of our children and young people. And I'm sure for many people here, actually, um, you know, they'll be looking at it, like we said, from different contexts as to whether they're wearing a parent hat tonight or looking at in terms of youth ministry, church ministry, or indeed as teachers. So thank you for framing all of that for us. We're going to take it on a bit deeper now um, to put not only you, Ed, on the spot, but bring in our um, brilliant guests with you as well, if that's OK, because 
what we'd love to do is again it's the backdrop of like you said some of the bible context there as ed you've just outlined for us some of the um, both theory and best practice we'd love to really grill you um ed and amy and rose if that's okay um so i'm going to invite you to take yourselves off mute if that's okay and welcome um the three of you um what I'd love to do is just, if that's all right, to get you to introduce yourselves to folks that are with us um, this evening. Uh, maybe Amy, I might come to you first, if that's OK, um, and then Rose, and then we'll come back to Ed. It'd be really great if as we go into sort of looking at some of the questions that we and those watching might want to pose to you, what I'd love to ask each of you is just in a couple of minutes, could you tell us who you are, maybe what you do personally, but just outline for us so that we can get to know you a little bit, outline for us a bit of your family context, any children you've got and so on. Would that be all right? So Amy, thanks so much for being with us. Tell us a bit about you, like we said, your broader family context. Uh, hi, so I'm Amy, I work with Ed, I write some of the resources that he's been talking about this evening. Um, so I have four children, uh, my eldest is 15. I have three boys, uh, 15, 14 and 12, and a daughter who is 11, and we live in Liverpool. Amazing. Thanks so much, Amy. Uh, four children. You're a brave woman. <laughs> in many <Amazing>. ways. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining us. Rose, lovely to have you with us. Would you also do the same? Tell us a bit about you, first of all. What do you do? Where do you live? And then tell us a bit about your family too. Thanks. Thank you, Rachel. Yes, my name is Rose. I am dialing in from Northern Ireland, right on the North Coast, so I can hear the waves just behind me. Um, Peter and I have two children. We have two daughters. One is 14 and the other is 10. I work very part time in the hospital as a pharmacist. I used to be paediatrics and then now I'm just general dispensary. Um, and the rest of the time I, I work at home with family. Mm -hmm. And Lovely. that's a full-time job in itself. Lovely. I have French homework to do, so I'm so glad to hear you say you were doing French earlier. So I'll just, after, <laughs> after this is over, if I could just borrow you, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Dear, what have I got myself into? No, that'd be great. Thanks, Rose. Um, and Ed, we've obviously heard from you. Thanks for outlining some of the amazing work and the resources of Faith in Kids. But tell us about you, whereabouts you live, and tell us about your, I know you've alluded to your, your children. Tell us a bit more. Uh, I'm in southwest London, uh, married to Mary, and there are three children aged between eight and 16. So Beth is the eldest, and um, it's good for a dad to try and fathom how to raise a girl, and then two boys after that. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, and I'm sure some, as I was listening to you as well, as some of the questions about that sort of the appropriate interlinking fathers, daughters, mums, sons, so I'd love to quiz you about that in just a few moments, but um, great. Thank you for sharing that. So we know a little bit about you. We know a little bit about your family context. Let me dive straight in, if that's OK, because this is the bit where we just want to get real and gritty and talk about maybe the trials and tribulations, but also the joys. So my first question, um, and maybe Amy, I could come to you first, if that's OK. Um, but indeed, it'd be great to have a snapshot from each of you would be as oh. your four children, you said, as your children have been growing up, I think you said your eldest is 15. Mm -hmm. When did you when did you we've heard some of the theory from Ed and the best practices so on for you personally, when did you start actually speaking to your own children about their bodies, given the subject of talking about our bodies tonight? Um, moving on to puberty and was that a one conversation or has it been ongoing how has that been for you uh well I think uh fortunately I'm gonna say I I don't remember when we started talking about our bodies because it happened so early and so quickly so when you've got children in the bath and children in and out of the bath and that's when the conversations began um, we've had questions about, you know, am I thin? Am I fat? Am I big? Am I tall? Is my my hair, my cut, my eyes are different from yours. Whose is better? So I think those conversations about our bodies and God giving us a good body and God giving us the right body, um, and having a child who has um, some disabilities and a struggle with that, those conversations started early. Um, and as they've grown and into puberty, those conversations have have changed, um, and noticing change in others, noticing um differences in mum's body and dad's body and you know kids are very good and my kids have always been very straight at asking things um and I think probably around year four year five of primary school um were the times that we really started oh. to talk about puberty body changes growing up 
and wanting to be ahead of the curve for the, the conversations that were coming in school so that they'd heard me talk about these things and their dad talk about these things first rather than hearing it from someone else. Mm, interesting. Yeah, thanks, Amy. So you've flagged an interesting point already there, which maybe we'll come back to is just actually, as you said, you were kind of almost ahead of the curve, knowing what was coming up in school, which is sometimes mm -hmm. tricky, actually, isn't it? Not always that aware of what's on our school curriculums. But like you said, if you had a glimpse or knew what was coming up, then that actually equipped you to be able to almost get in there first with some of those conversations. Um Thank you for that. Rose, I wonder if I could come to you next with a similar question, um, but just touching on something Amy said as well. So again, for you, you mentioned you've got two girls. Uh, remind us um, maybe how old they are. But again, for you and your husband, when did when did you start again sort of talking to them about body sort of changing and so on? Um, and the element that I don't know, if, I hope you don't mind, I'm going to pick up from what Amy said of just that personal awareness as well as mum and dad, you know, our own bodies being in the house, you know, states of undress or not. How has that been for you? And in terms of an age appropriate nature of, you know, how open we are or where the boundary lines are, if that's OK, I'd love you to just tell us a bit about, yeah, how those conversations have developed, but just looking at that aspect as well of, you know, our own privacy or openness and so on. How's that been for you guys? Yeah, so we have two daughters. Karen is 14 and Lucia is 10. And I kind of feel we, a bit like what Ed and Amy already said, I feel we've kind of always been addressing it. It's just been, we run a very open conversational type home. There's lots of conversations happen around the table and all sorts of, all sorts of places. Um, and that is, you know, I also think but we, we, we both love um, theology. And I think we have also tried at various stages with, as the kids have grown up to kind of introduce and debunk a lot of the stuff that comes in around, especially, especially gender stereotypes. Um, and so to make our kids proud of who they are as human beings, first and foremost, and not necessarily as girls that fit into are expected to fit into a certain into a certain form like certainly from very young um so it's been quite an organic process the whole way we're all very open about our bodies we all use the proper language the proper terms um there were a couple of books i remember when the kids were really small maybe about three or four i got a book that was illustrated by mike ink pen i think it's called who made me or something like that and it's quite a, you know, it's quite a, it's a very open book. It's a very clearly described book. It just, it works through the process of falling in love, what your bodies look like, what sex looks like. There's diagrams, there's, they use sort of terms that are, you can, we kind of used as a platform for our kids who at that point probably say it was three and Karen was about seven. Um, because it sets out a very sort of clear biblical, there's a mom, there's a dad, they fall in love, they get married, then they have kids. So that was a platform for our kids then to begin to say, mm. oh, but my friend in school is, that's a bit different. So what does that look like? So we've always tried to talk about it with great kindness and encourage mm. them when they see difference in their friends and see difference in their classroom, again, to approach that with real kindness and a real openness to listen and not judge. Um, but in terms of like in terms of um, body image, I'm also really well, I don't know how to describe it, but I'm we have been very strict on things like screens and social media and I'm not on social media. And we've really tried to lead from as parents to say there's lots of influences out there that are trying to shape you and form you as to who and tell you who you should be and how you should feel. Um, and you will of course encounter those and as you get older you will encounter them more and more but let's also talk about what they're also trying to do um so we've had very open conversations um watch movies together yeah. you know um so yeah and term very practically you know puberty has been a very practical conversation of you know actually it was quite funny peter and karen decided when she was about 10 to read Anne frank together and he thought he'd left the conversation of puberty up to me. But actually in the Anne Frank diaries, she discusses puberty quite a lot. So we actually said, actually, this came up in our conversation about Anne Frank and he really wasn't expecting it. And there's a lot about periods <laughs> and feelings and emotions and teenagers and love and confusion in Anne Frank. So it's just funny how it just sort of comes in in lots of in lots of different in lots of different ways. But yeah, I don't know if that mm -hmm. answers your yeah. 
Apparently. Yeah, absolutely. No, really helpful, really helpful. And I think what you've provoked out lots of different um, things that you've said, but actually how useful using tools like books or resources can actually be. And again, a very age appropriate nature, but can sometimes maybe um, give us more confidence as well as to where to direct the conversations and so on. But yeah, loads in what you said. Thanks, Rose. Um, Ed, just come to you next and then I'll hand over to David for a, a question or two, if that's all right. Um, lovely to hear about yeah, your experience that you said again with um, with your own children. But I'd love to ask you particularly about you mentioned um, just earlier about, you know, using the language that um, that is just quite frank and quite direct for parents who might be listening or indeed youth leaders, mentors, those alongside young people, what would your top tips be for people who just feel really embarrassed to even go there with using some of the language, which actually is quite disarming for young people when you do use it, isn't it? Because they don't almost expect you to. But if that's helpful from what you've shared and encouraged us to do, what would be your top tips as to how we as adults can almost overcome ourselves to kind of go there in those sorts of conversations so yeah if you could share a bit of your experience and then launch into that it'd be helpful I, I want to be really clear that I don't find this easy and that sort of roadmap I I gave you I'm not keeping up with it you know that if, if I sort of trace through my three children and where my wife and I feel we've got to with the conversations there, there are so many we we wish we'd had already and we you know even in this week you know have you have you talked about that yet with her and the answer was no so we find it difficult uh our story definitely is awkward moments happen when it comes up i think as my children have got older it's less like where do the cows come from and and now it's me asking them you know is pornography being talked about amongst your friendship group at secondary school is me trying to ask questions that allows them to know i'm not putting them on the spot i want to understand the air they're breathing i think on just the, on those words i really do think it comes down to who do we want them to hear it from so all the surveys and say our children and young people want to be talking about these things. They want to be talking about their bodies. They want to be talking about sex. They want to understand. They want to know how to make good decisions. Wouldn't it be a crying shame if, if the people who loved them most weren't answering the questions they most wanted to answer? So I, I, I think it just comes down to love and care. And there's just so many aspects of parenting, which is just get over yourselves. Uh, you know, if it's, you don't ever get any privacy. You never get the meal when you want it. You never get to have the fun you want. Parenting is essentially spent loving the other. And this is just one of those areas where you wouldn't choose to do it. And you've probably got to this point in your life without having to do it unless you're a doctor or something. So let's get over ourselves, love our kids well and get talking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Ed. That's really helpful. I really appreciate your honesty that this is uh, none of us are experts in this, are we? We're all guessing and learning as we go. And uh, yeah, one thing that comes back to mind for me just before I hand over to David was talking to um, uh, a teenage girl many years ago. Actually, she was now 28 nearly, but when she was about um, 17, talking to her about her own experiences of um, having grown up in a, in a Christian family, but quizzing her. Um, because I've worked with um, lots of teenage girls and just asking her, you know, when was it that you were first sort of ha had conversations with your mum and dad um, about sort of the birds and the bees, sex and relationships and so on? And and as the conversation unfolded, she told me that she never had had those conversations with her parents. And we sort of teased it out a little bit and the conversation carried on. And what I saw in her um, was this rising sense of annoyance, of like frustration. Why haven't they spoke? Why didn't they ever speak to me? Um, and I just, it stuck in my mind as almost, as you said there, Ed, you know, actually what I was interested to see is from a young person's perspective, who was now obviously a growing teenager, 17, nearly 18, that her reflection looking back was actually, she was frustrated that her parents hadn't gone there in conversations. Um, and so I asked her where she'd learned things from and of course it was other external factors of the parents and so on so yeah just leaning into what you said there actually it may not be comfortable but actually our young people probably do want us to be the ones who actually broach some of these subjects with them however tricky and uh, embarrassing it may feel to them or to us at times but thank you Ed. it's really great to get to know um, the three of you and um, a little bit about your context thanks for sharing that I'm going to hand over to David who's got a few brilliant questions coming in from um for those watching on so David over to you great thanks so much Rachel and thanks everyone so far I'm aware my internet is a little intermittent so hopefully you can hear me okay 
But I'm going to fire out some of the questions that we've been getting in from those of you who are joining us tonight. Uh, panelists, I'm going to encourage you to keep your response to about a minute um, and we'll try and get through uh, as many questions as we can. But the first question straight in there, um, we've touched on this, but maybe a little more advice. They're saying um, this uh, lady, her granddaughter is four and a half and she's already asking where about how babies are made. And they're basically asking for advice uh, on how to share this with four and a half year olds sort of appropriately. And they've said, is it true that if they ask the question, they're ready for the answer? So four and a half year old, um, asking how babies are made. Um, Amy, I'm going to come to you. Um, so I think I would say if they are asking the question, it's not a bad rule of thumb to think that they are ready for a certain level of answer. Um, uh, you know your child, you know your grandchild well. Um, I would be wanting to say this is the way God has designed our bodies. This is the way um, a, a new family begins. Um, in marriage, a baby is born. I would be talking in um, terms of the process of a mummy and a daddy coming together and loving. So I would be I would be keeping it very simple. I would be keeping it very clear. And I would be saying this is part of God's good design. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Rose or Ed, anything you just want to add into that? Yeah, I agree. I think kids check in and check out. It's not a once conversation and they might ask the question and then you realise from their facial expression aligning that they've changed their mind. <laughs> they want to talk about something else and that's okay. I think we take our lead from them, but I think we should always respect and respond if the question is asked for sure. I'd be more interested in wanting to come back the next time they've got a question than whether you answered that one well. <laughs> Brilliant. No, that's really helpful. Ed? I would only say uh, I think it is OK to start conversations before they ask you, particularly if you're a parent or a carer, uh, which is you get to navigate what you think is coming down the road. And publications like Time to Talk are very helpful for that, just to give you the sense of where are we at and what's coming next. You don't have to give an extensive answer exactly as Amy and Rosie just said, but to start the conversation so they know they can come back. Thanks so much. Rachel? Brilliant. We've got another question for you, if I can fire that over to you. And um, Rose, maybe we can come to you first, if that's all right. So this question comes asking for practical tips for a young child. And it says this, my five-year-old told me that she was playing um, chase where the boys were trying to catch them and kiss them. Many of us would know that as kiss chase, wouldn't we, from years gone by. Um, but she believes that the children or the boys that were trying to chase um, her five-year-old and others were in the class above her. The question is, do you think that this is something that I should highlight with the school? Um, her daughter didn't seem to be um, too bothered about it or too upset. So is it OK or is it something to actually highlight with the school or the teacher, do you think? It's an interesting one. Like, I think if there is an age dynamic there. So I think if it's an older boy, it's trying to, it's try, again, you know your own child. It, how comfortable is your child? And I don't think there is at any point too young to say a no is a no. And, it, you know, the, and, and if you feel uncomfortable in any way, even if that's, even if that's an adult, a trusted adult in your home who comes in and gathers you up for a hug, you know, if if you as a child feel that's my space. And I think as parents, I am quite, there are times I have felt Lucia move into me when older boys have moved to, and I, she almost goes behind my back. Like I just, I can sort of feel her just going behind my back. And it's definitely a dynamic. I would discuss with the school that they can observe in the playground what what's going on we don't like I think certainly the school our kids are at and I'm a governor in the primary school here are I think the more involvement we can have in the local school and whether that, I, I think that has to be done sensitively you're not you're not itching for trouble but it's just saying can you you're, you're my eyes in the in the playground can you tell me what's going on and can you keep an eye on it but I think it's okay yeah. at any age to say to a child how does that make you feel do you feel comfortable yeah Mm, really helpful Rose yeah because I guess what you're instilling is that sense of not just what's happening in that moment but like you said the broader context adults being on the scene or in your home and yeah really good example that that learning kind of can cascade into other situations I guess yeah any other thoughts from Ed or Amy if not we'll go to the next question no David great I will jump in with the next question they're coming in thick and fast now so I'll try and keep 
uh, going quickly. So if you have siblings, uh, say age eight and a six year old, eight year old and six year old, would you have the conversation together or would you speak to them separately? Amy, I'll come to you with four boys. Uh, I would say I would speak to my children separately because my children have different personalities um, and different needs. Uh, so I think it's really important that some of those conversations, they aren't worried about the other person who's also there, even if it's their sibling, so that they can feel free to ask the silly question, the embarrassing follow up that um, I just think one to one is generally a better plan. Really helpful. Thank you. Rachel, next one. Hmm. Next question comes from a youth minister or church leader perspective. And it says, if, as we're saying, that parents are ultimately best placed um, to have these conversations with their own young people, two questions are, um, one, how do we even start to instill that in parents to encourage them to be the ones to acknowledge that and to have those conversations? And the second part of the question is, as a, again, a youth leader or children's minister and so on, what is appropriate or not in terms of how far they can go into some of these conversations if, for example, the parents aren't present? Which I'm guessing in your, most uh, youth ministry contexts, it's the youth leaders without the parents. Um, Ed, can I come to you? Yeah. Look, I my experience is, is most parents are waiting for someone to help rather than hoping everyone's going to just stay out. So uh, my suggestion would first of all be is, is start the conversation by having a series. Most churches, the data says, are very poor at discussing these things with young people uh, and, and haven't made a start at all, which means you're wide open to begin a conversation about bodies, body image, gender, just, just the uh, and um, David's case studies on consent and harassment. Th these are these are very easy topics to handle from a Christian point of view. They may be awkward, but the Bible has clear things to say. And to tell parents we're starting these conversations, to make sure there's a simple email that goes out to parents with the with clearly these are the points we want to cover. Maybe some suggestions of how you could take them further, and certainly invite them to come and talk to you drop your line if any of this is concerning them but just to start the conversation and to bring parents into it uh and i guess you each know your church so if you if you start on that simple level you'll quickly find out what's the temperature in our church what's the willingness to for us to be involved in these conversations brilliant thank you rose i'm going to come to you uh, someone's asked they have um they're talking to a group of girls about self-worth and about um, sort of these issues, bodies and sex. Some of the girls may already have had sex, some some haven't. Um, how would you sort of speak to this group of girls, um, teenage girls, um, who are just at that critical stage? Gracious. Hmm, here's a question and a half. Um, I guess back to something that Ed was saying in the book that he was posting um, earlier, it's we have to go over identity always it's just something we have to keep going with so at whatever stage you're at whatever whatever stage you get to, to pitch in with somebody I think it's it's critical that they know who they are um and again it's that very open conversation of and very clear cut this is who you are you know you are made in God's image you are a human being formed you are precious you are wonderful now let's talk about and I would I would actually ask them what what would you what what are you bringing into this conversation? I think it's very important to sort of figure out in the room what people where they're at, what they're carrying. But very much, I have a real strong sense as a parent that, especially when we as Christians are parents, it's like we do carry something, we do carry something into a room when we are talking to teenage girls. And I think if they see your heart for them and they see that you are rooting for them, and that. And like, like their creator, you want them to be the best version of themselves. I think you open up a space in which they can come and be part of that conversation. I think especially teenage girls, they have to be, they have to be part of it and bring in, you know, begin to begin to look at what, what, what do you, what do you see about yourself? What is it you think you need to be as a girl? Like start, start to pull, start to pull away all those sort of cultural formational images that they have in their head. Talk about phone use, talk about the platforms they're on, talk about how they spend their time and what they look at. 
um, and begin to help them um, see themselves differently, I guess. And again, it has to be in a very kind, accepting, graceful um, environment where first and foremost, they walk in and they know they're loved. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Rose. Um, we were just talking there about teenage girls. Going to go slightly down to the other end of uh, the lower end of the age spectrum. And Amy, I wonder if I can come to you. The next question is around actually, if we're thinking back to sort of um, toddlers, little ones who are very used to running around, you know, naked in the gardens in summertime, that kind of thing. The question is around how do we actually help our children transition to be that little bit older, age five to seven, and so on, um, and to be maybe learning to cover up a little bit more and so on transitioning as they get that little bit older but to not the questions around it, how do we do that without instilling yeah. a sense of shame or fear and so on yeah great question um so i think uh one of the big things about this is we've already talked a lot about the goodness of their body um and now we want to sort of as they're starting to notice differences in bodies you have a, a girl's body a boy's body a male body a female body your body is wonderfully made and it's special and there's that you have different parts of your body that show that you are either a boy or a girl, male or female, and those parts of your body are wonderful and they are given to you by God. And so we treat them with special care. We treat them with respect. Um, so we cover them when we're around other people, not because we're embarrassed about them, but because we know they're brilliant. Um, so I think that's how I'd be talking about it. So that's why, you know, we're, we're going to wear pants now. We're going to put this top on now because your body is a brilliant body and we want to look after it well. Um, I can remember having had these conversations with uh, my my daughter um, and there's a there's a brilliant uh, there's the Pantosaurus. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the Pantosaurus song about how you keep your pants on. Um, and she was at swimming lessons and she was about five and jumping in the pool and trying to build a confidence. And the swimming teacher went to pick her up because they were in the water with him. And she shouted at him, you can't touch me on my swimming costume. <laughs> So I just thought I was quite proud of that feisty moment that I thought, yes. Um, and he was like, oh, I'm sorry. I was just trying to help you in the water. I'm going to do it myself, she says. So I think just that sort of um, care for our bodies as a wonderful thing rather than an embarrassment to hide. Brilliant. Thanks, Harry. David? Yeah, there's so many questions coming in and we're not going to get through them all, but I'm just there's one question here that maybe summarizes quite a few. There's lots of tricky topics being taught in the classroom and kids may hear things, particularly as they get older, that we're, are going to jar with our Christian understanding of the world. How you know, we can't cover their eyes and their ears forever and actually that's not protecting them as they grow up. So how do we um, help them to navigate um, things that they may disagree with um, or things that may jar with their Christian faith? I suppose thinking of older kids, but also maybe even in primary school, how do you maybe prepare kids? And I'm going to come to you on that one. I normally find that if you ask a six-year-old, uh, he or she will say everyone in his class is a Christian. And if you ask an eight-year-old, they'll say, I'm the only child in my class who's a Christian. So I find normally between the ages of about six and eight, uh, there's that big shift and the sudden discovery that Others don't go to church and they don't believe what we do about Jesus. So I, I think in some ways we just need to be aware that from eight, our child is thinking a lot about it, even if they're not saying it out loud. Our children are thinking a lot from the age of eight onwards. Other people don't believe this. They're talking less about church and their own experience and their own beliefs. Not all. Some want to continue to be loud and proud and boisterous about it. Brilliant. So I would say that, therefore, how we approach all of these issues is the same, which is we acknowledge the difference. We might want to use language like I think other people are confused. Uh, we might want to use language like they, they don't they don't believe what we believe or in our family. We know that or the Bible says that language that doesn't ostracize others, but does show there's a difference and we continue to love them. So I, I think on this topic we're discussing tonight, it's one of those issues, sexual ethics, uh, what we look at, what is good for us. We just say in our family, because the Bible says, because Jesus said, we use that kind of language. Thanks so much. Rachel, one last question, um, and then we'll come to Nicola. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much to all of you for what you shared so far. Um, one important question um, that's coming as well, and there's loads more I'm sure that we won't have time to cover, but it says this, how, what would your advice be to adults who are wanting to engage with their young people, whatever their context, but actually as part of their own backstory, as part of their own history, actually there's been a history of some sexual abuse or abuse of some kind. How, what would your encouragement be to them as to how they grapple with engaging with their own children, young people, or in their context, but equally some of this, these conversations actually, you know, brings up some of their own emotions as well. What would your top tips be to them as to how they can grapple with both of those at the same time, I guess? Um, Amy, maybe I come to you. Uh, I think I would say um, you want to get some support for you as you do this. So you want to have somebody for you to talk this mm -hmm. through um, so that uh, you've got someone walking with you as you try to navigate supporting someone else, you have someone supporting you. Um, I think wanting to be helpful and wanting to perhaps say you've experienced hurt and brokenness and so you want to do something well, I think that's a brilliant starting point and just making sure you've got someone who's going to help you and walk with you as you do that is great. Yeah, really wise. Thanks, Amy. Anything to add from Rose, Ed? No? Great. Thanks, Amy. That's really helpful. David, let me pass back to you to introduce our next section. Thanks. Right. Thanks so much. And I think that last question, just a timely reminder that these are really difficult, sensitive issues. They bring up a lot for all of us. We're all broken in so many ways mm -hmm. uh, and we want to deal with these things well, sensitively, biblically uh, and with, with compassion, with grace. Nicola, I want to come to you. Um, Nicola is our Westminster Policy Officer, uh, and these are live issues across the nation. So, um, Nicola, I'm just I'm going to ask you just maybe to give us a quick overview of what the policy landscape looks like and um, what's going on in politics around these issues across the nations. Just a quick check in. We're going to be hopefully wrapped up by 10, quarter past nine at the latest, just for a quick time check um, for you all. Sure. Thanks, David. Um, and thanks to all of you that have joined us this evening. Depending on where you're based in the UK, you may know RSE, Relationship, Sex and, Edu uh, Relationship and Sex Education, by a different acronym or name. But no matter what name you know it by or what nation of the UK you're in, your child will be learning about relationships and maybe about sex too. So we want you to know what your rights are around uh, RSE as parents or carers and answer questions you might have, such as, can I have input into what's in the curriculum? Can I have access to the teaching materials in advance? And can I opt my child out of RSE lessons? Let's just take a really quick dive into those questions. Um, to start with, the main area of common ground across the UK is that in every nation, RSE is part of the curriculum and parents and carers are permitted and encouraged to be involved in ongoing consultations around the RSE policy within their child's school. Therefore, we recommend that you ask your school for a written copy of the policy to be sent to you. From there, you can do you can ask more questions of what RSE will look like in practicality. Um, we've written a short list of questions that you might want to start with, so please do take a look at our Time to Talk resource that's been mentioned a few times tonight. Page 29 will be uh, particularly helpful with that. But there are differences in approach to RSE across the nations, um, so let's have a quick look at what that looks like in each of the nations in the UK. Um, first, let's start with England. Um, Education on relationships is compulsory across all schools, both primary and secondary, while sex education is only compulsory in secondary schools. But your primary school can choose for themselves whether they teach this content or not. So your primary school might teach about sex, they might not. Um, and although schools in England are not required to show you resources, um, all the resources that they use in RSHE lessons, you are able to access what topics are being covered. As a parent or carer in England, you cannot opt your child out of relationship education at any level, but you can opt them out of sex education if they're in primary school. Uh, in secondary school, you can request an opt out, but it's up to the head teacher whether 
uh, this request is approved or not. Now, looking at Scotland, uh, there is no statutory RSHP, that is Relationship, Sexual Health and Parenthood curriculum, meaning that teachers are not given a prescriptive list of topics that they must teach at particular stages. Individual teachers and schools should decide on how to deliver the curriculum based on local needs and circumstances. Um, all parents should be given the opportunity in Scotland to view key teaching materials in advance and uh, to ask questions about these materials. If you're a parent or carer in Scotland and you wish to withdraw a school-aged child from sexual health education lessons, schools are required to remind you first that it's your child's right to an education. However, it's ultimately your decision whether you withdraw your child from sex ed lessons. Now, over in Wales, RSE is required to be developmentally appropriate. Education about relationships and early development is required to focus on building healthy relationships and self-esteem. Uh, the Evangelical Alliance team in Wales played an important role in making sure that the government put a focus on platonic relationships into the curriculum, which is a really important part of learning to develop all kinds of relationships. So we're really glad that that did become part of the curriculum. Now, as a parent or carer in Wales, you cannot withdraw your child from relationship education, both in primary and secondary school, but you can withdraw your child from classes on sex, unless it's part of the science curriculum, again, both in primary and secondary school, until your child reaches the age of 15. And once they're 15, it becomes their decision whether they receive these lessons or not. And then last but not least, in Northern Ireland, the statutory curriculum prescribes a minimum level of content that children should be taught, but individual teachers and schools have flexibility on the curriculum. Grant-aided schools should develop their own policy on RSE, which should be subject to consultation with parents and pupils. It should also reflect the moral and religious principles held by parents and school management authorities. In Northern Ireland, there is currently no legislative provision permitting you to withdraw your child from sex education. However, you can request this. Um, you can request it for particular lessons and it's up to the school whether they grant that on a case-to-case -case basis. So that was a very quick overview of what's going on across the nations, what your rights are as a parent. Um, please do email us if you have any more questions about that. I realise that was a really quick overview. Um, but just to draw to your attention that the landscape of RSE is changing in some of the nations. Um, the UK government are currently conducting a re review. We'll expect a consultation to come out in autumn or winter. The Scottish government has brought out statutory or draft guidance on RSHP, and there's currently a consultation open that closes on the 23rd of November. And then similarly, um, RSE is undergoing changes in Northern Ireland, um, so there's a public consultation there as well that closes on the 24th of November. Now, we'll be responding to these on behalf of our members, um, but we really encourage you to also be responding to these as individuals or maybe even churches. Uh, please do take a look at our website where we provide some support and how to um, respond to these. And yeah, if we, we would love you to do that. We'd love you to sign up to our monthly emails that keep you up to date on what we're doing as an advocacy team. It's called Everything Advocacy. You can find it on our website on the public policy page. And it will, if you sign up for those, that will keep you up to date with what we're doing around RSE. It'll help you respond to these consultations and it'll keep you up to date in general about what we're doing Um advocacy wise across the UK um, and representing our members so thanks for listening to that I'll pass you back to David now. Amazing Nicola thank you so much um, that was such a brief um, but comprehensive overview um, of what's going on. Uh, some of you will know us really well the Evangelical Alliance and some of you won't uh, and just want to take a couple of moments just to share a little bit about who we are and what we do. Um, We've been around for 175 years, 
uh, where an alliance of churches, um, thousands of churches, hundreds of organizations, and tens of thousands of individuals who make up this evangelical alliance. What do we do? We talk about three R's. We try to resource the church and our membership to share Jesus, to make him known. We try to build um, some relationship, um, sorry, resources like, like Time to Talk, like a piece of research that Rachel's being involved in called Talking Jesus about evangelism and sharing faith, uh, and just all kinds of resources to help you live well and respond to this challenging cultural moment that we are in. We also build relationships across the denominations, across the independent churches. We try to unify and build unity across the UK and local gatherings, uh, probably in the area where you're living. There's a group of Evangelical Alliance churches working together to make Jesus known and to serve their local communities. We also represent, and that's what Nicola has been talking about, um, right across the nations, we represent evangelicals and their members in the corridors of power and influence. And we try to be a Christian voice in the public square. We also want to bring marginalized voices there and stand with them in sol solidarity and provide and open doors and platforms for people who don't often get heard. So we can only do this all because of our members. And I'd love to invite you tonight to join us in membership. If you do, we will uh, send out a welcome pack to you in the post. And that will be a book from Gav Calver, our uh, boss who leads the organization with passion and drive and vision. We'll also send you a copy of Time to Talk and lots of little bits like a trolley coin and a pen and all kinds of things. But you can join tonight for just three pounds a month for an individual. And actually, if you're a couple, it's three pounds a month as well. So we love if you would sign up. There's more details in the chat, but it really helps us whenever we are creating resources to be able to draw upon the skills of our members or whenever we're advocating to be able to um, say to the government, listen, we represent X thousand people and, and we really care about these these issues. So for the price of a coffee, you can sign up. Um, so something to do, uh, and just click the link now. I'll hand over to you, Rachel, but thank you so much, everyone, for uh, joining us tonight. Um, personally, I just really appreciate it. It's been an absolute delight, and I uh, really do appreciate um, you all joining us. Thanks so much, David. Um, yep, yeah, just as we're about to draw to a close, just a couple of things to remind you of. One, I hope that you've um, not only enjoyed listening to our panellists and our guests tonight, our massive thanks to you, Ed. Uh, for all that you shared with us right from the outset and in the questions time. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, for yourself, Amy, and to you, Rose, we hugely value your time and your input. Thank you for sharing honestly and vulnerably with us about your own context. Um, hopefully all of you listening have not only um, been able to engage with some of that, and thank you for sharing your questions with us as well, but I'm sure you probably, like me, realise that this is just the beginning of a journey, really, isn't it? Delving into some of these critical areas. Um, and there's lots more conversations to be had. We'd love you to stay connected with us, as Nicola said, um, and as you saw come up in the chat there, if you'd like to know more about any upcoming webinars around the Time to Talk content and what's um, in the resource as well, please do sign up to that Everything Advocacy email address and we'd love to keep you in touch of looking ahead to the new year and what plans we've got to go further into the future. Also, just to say, if you've not got one of these booklets and you'd like to download it for free, single copies are available on the website. But it'd be great sort of resource to have if you're in, say, a, a small group, um, a prayer triplet, or you just uh, gather with groups of parents to actually pray for your kids and so on. There's loads of topics, as we said, right from the outset um, that you might want to work through. And if you've got any questions along the way, as we've said, do get in touch with us. We'd love to support and resource you. But all that remains to say is huge thanks to all of you for joining us this evening on this busy September term and on um, a busy Monday evening. We really appreciate your time. Um, it'd be great if, just as we go, um, if you'll allow me to just pray for us against the backdrop of all that we've shared. And as we go from here, let me just close in prayer together, if that's OK. Father God, we just thank you for this evening. Thank you for the time we've had to um, put aside to just come and um, engage with some of these real and gritty and important topics. Lord, thank you for the young people. Um, the children, young people, young adults that you've put in our care, Lord, whether we're a parent, a youth leader, a church leader, anyone involved in the school context and all that we've discussed, Jesus, we just come to you and ask, Lord, for your wisdom, for your insight, for your peace, for your guidance, for your equipping, Lord. May we not be um, crippled by fear, but actually pray, Lord, that by 
the power of your spirit, would we be equipped to be brave and bold and timely in these conversations with the young people um, that you've put around us? Lord, may we just gain great encouragement from what we've heard this evening. And um, I pray that in the coming days and weeks and months, would we just be really in tune with where your spirit leads and open up these conversations that our young people would feel not only loved and listened to and heard and seen by us, but ultimately would they know that they are loved um, and admired and poured into by your spirit too, Lord. So we just pray your blessing and your protection over us all and the families um, and the communities that we represent and pray for you, the guidance and wisdom of your spirit as we go from here. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you again for joining. Please stay connected. Do join us as a member if you're able um, and stay connected with us in terms of the time to talk conversation into the new year and beyond. We'd love to have you with us. So we hope to hear from you very soon. Thanks again. Every blessing on your week. Uh, God bless for now. We'll see you soon. Take care. Bye.